Come in, come in. Shut the door behind you. Thank you. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is uh, Jay Pipes. I work at Marantis. I work on the Nova project upstream. And my colleague over here in the API working group, Chris Dent, the one with hair, um, he's going to be uh, joining me on stage here in a bit to uh, demo the, the Gabby tool. But we're going to talk today about why APIs matter. So if I can get this working. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. All right. So the biggest reason that APIs matter is they're the first thing that developers see when they interact with OpenStack. I mean, you could say, well, developers also you know, use the Python clients, right? But not all developers are. Python people, right? We have SDKs for Java and all sorts of other languages. So all of those things are making calls to the APIs. And so if you think about it, the, the RESTful APIs that um, the OpenStack projects publish are our first impression. So we want to be looking professional, as my little pug friend here looks. We want to seem like we're well put together, we're consistent, m mature. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of what our APIs, the impression that they tend to give. Not all of them, but um, when you look at the inconsistencies amongst our RESTful APIs, a lot of times these are the sorts of impressions that you get. Well, it's kind of like, you know, immature or unprofessional. It's like toy APIs, that kind of thing. Um, and especially this, these last two points, um, not being deliberate, right? When I say that, I mean that sometimes our APIs seem like they just kind of appeared when someone likes, it wasn't like a, a full process of design. It was just like, well, let's see if this works and just throw it out there. Um, and the incoherentness can sometimes uh, come into play because you'll be using one REST API for one service and you'll be trying to do something almost identical in another service API and it's entirely different <laughs> for reasons that you can't as a developer comprehend or as we can comprehend. So here's an example of where things are incoherent and not deliberate. Admin actions. So what do I mean by admin actions? Like things that cloud admins can do, right? Um, just taking Nova as an example here. Uh, we have things called API extensions in, in Nova that extend the API in, in some ways and allow, allow uh, different types of actions to be uh, performed against the API. Well, we have an API extension in Nova called OS Admin Actions. And there's various things in there, like pause server, lock server. These are different actions. It's not really RESTful, but we'll get into that later. Um, but yet, other things that are administrative actions aren't in the API extension that's called OS Admin Actions. So for instance, changing the admin password, you can do that in a completely separate way, uh, but it's not in the OS admin's uh, actions extension. And so you can't discover it in the same way. It's actually OS change password or something. Some admin actions are embedded into other API calls like create server. So for instance, as a normal user, you can't force a particular um, placement onto a specific host. But you can do that as an admin. But the entire API call is all within the post server's 
API call. It's not an API extension. It's not discoverable in that way. But also, remember the change password thing? Well, there's also a different API extension called OS, chain or OS server password that allows you to kind of do that. Instead of changing the password, it allows you to reset and clear the password. No idea why one is in you know, the, a different extension than the other, but it's completely incoherent and inconsistent. And unless you're going through a lot of the code and you know, Ann Gentle and, and the doc team have made superhuman strides in getting the API documented on the opusstack.org site. Um, but unless you go through it with a fine tooth comb, honestly, you're going to miss really subtle inconsistencies like this. And um, it's just kind of all over the place. Um, other things that have their own extension entirely. So again, before we had this OS admin extension or OS admin actions extension. So you could pause server, do this and that. Other, other resources have their own entire API extension. Um, but other, other extensions like OS guests only works with the Zen hypervisor. But there's no indication of that through the API. You'd have to go in and look at the documentation, and, you know, just sort of discover it by, by accident. So that kind of thing, when you see that an API only applies to a specific driver, that is what I consider to be implementation details leaking out of the API, right? Um, and that's the kind of thing that gives the impression that our APIs are kind of toy, or they're, you know, they're not really deliberate. They're, they haven't been thought through much. OK, so finally, to end on the, uh, the admin actions thing. So Keystone has an entirely separate endpoint for its administrative actions, like adding a user, you know, adding a, a role to a user um, groups and things like that, but only in the V2 API. <laughs> in the V3 API, it's all back into one endpoint again. No idea why, but that's the case. So surprise. Example number two of where we are completely inconsistent in our APIs. Metadata, which I really hate the, the term metadata for a reason. Um, the definition of metadata is it's data about data. Um, we refer to data as metadata in a lot of cases, right? So data, like a good example of metadata is the size of an int, right? It's data that describes other data. Well, we use metadata to refer to key value pairs, like just random strings and all sorts of other things that is actually not metadata, but we call it metadata. Anyway, so arbitrary collections of key value pairs that we call metadata. Glance V1 has something called image properties. So there's these arbitrary key value pairs that are attached to um, image resources. So Glance V2 also has the same concept of image properties, but it also has these simple string tags, um, which is great. And both of them can be manipulated via the um, uh, images object resource, but only one of those things can be manipulated by its own collection resource. Again, surprise. No real coherency around it, right? If, if if we were implementing the tags collection resource in Glance now, and as, as I'm going to get to, the API working group was around, we might advise saying, you know, both of these things, image properties, key value pairs, and tags are a collection. They're a resource collection. Why don't you make the APIs look the same? Right? That's one thing we might advise. OK, so Nova and Cinder APIs also have this thing, but they call it metadata and not properties. Um, in Nova, you have instance metadata and system metadata. So system metadata is stuff that the Nova system itself attaches to instance records. Instance metadata is stuff that the user attaches to the instance. Um, Cinder has the exact same concept of this, but they don't call it system metadata. They call it admin metadata. Um, there's also glance metadata in Cinder, which is even more confusing. But uh, depending on you know, who you are, you see some or all of it. Um, not 
completely inconsistent between the two things. But it, it kind of sounds reasonable that you'd have this sort of segregated metadata. Um, but then when you really look into it, uh, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because instead, for instance, in Nova, there are certain types of system metadata, specifically stuff that around the flavor that an instance was spawned with, um, that are injected into system metadata. They were done that way because it was easier to just add a new key value property in system metadata than it was to actually change the database schema in Nova. So again, this is kind of where implementation leaks out of the API, because it was easier to do something than uh, to actually make an actual attribute on the instance resource. It was easier to just throw something in this little blob of key value pairs. Well, now we have a whole set of system metadata that are actually really just attributes, but we threw them into key value pairs because it was easier, right? Staying within Nova, we also have something called extra specs. Are extra specs any different at all from metadata? Anyone? No, they are exactly the same. They're just called extra specs. Uh, host aggregates and that literally, they're exactly, they're just key value pairs. Um, host aggregates and server groups have something called meta details. No idea why, it's the same thing. Um, so anyway, so these two examples of ways that our APIs, even within a single API like the compute API, are inconsistent. Why is it this way? Well, I've already described one of the reasons. It's just easier, right? <laughs> if, you've had, if you have this sort of uh, free form key value thing, and it's a lot easier just to throw stuff in there than change the instance schema and add a real attribute to it, well, that's some of the reasons why the API looks its way. Um, but other reasons are like good people disagree about how things should look. And because there hasn't really been a group that looks out for the consistency of the APIs across OpenStack projects, you know, these good people on different teams go in different directions and they don't necessarily communicate with each other. And so you get these sort of wildly different ways of doing virtually exactly the same thing. So about, what was it, four or five months ago, we started this effort called the API Working Group. It was actually pre-delivery. OK. What, seven, eight months? Yeah. OK. Seven, eight months ago. Thanks, Everett. <laughs> we created this API Working Group that our responsibilities involve looking across all of the OpenStack REST APIs and providing guidance to new projects, as well as um, showing existing projects how they can uh, evolve their API over time to become more consistent with each other. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you're in the API working group. I see a few people in here, yeah. So all, all of these folks are people that are concerned about what our APIs look like, right? That we, want us, we want it to seem professional and consistent and not baby pug, right? All right, so um, we work with the project teams to evolve the APIs. That's what we do. What we don't do, though, uh, we're not some kind of like Gestapo secret police that's, you know, like going in and, and uh, forcing people to, to change things or anything like that. Um, we just discuss what the guidance should be for a particular uh, rule, um, say, you know, the response code for a particular HTTP call. Um, and that guidance goes into a set of documents that gets published on the OpenStack.org site. Um, when we see something in one of the OpenStack projects that either is not quite aligned with that guidance or that there is no guidance in the, the API working group repository, then we create that guidance and, and help the project teams and the, the person that submitted that patch start to become more consistent with what, what the, the API working group has recommended. So here's some example guidance. Um, this actually comes from the uh, how to do tagging. So a couple projects have implemented simple string tagging. Glance 
has, um, Nova has a series of patches currently going through that implements server tagging. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had some guidance there so that the folks that are submitting these patches say, okay, we have something that we can go look at and, and determines you know, how we can make this uh, REST API look consistent with how other, other projects are doing it. Oh, I think that's the last. Is that just the last one? Right. Anyway. <laughs> Apologies, I thought I had something after this. But this is the last slide before I introduce Chris, and he explains the Gabby tool of how what, we're do what he's doing in Gabby is it's a tool that will functionally test the RESTful APIs of OpenStack projects and highlight where the inconsistencies currently are in a declarative fashion. So anyway. This is Chris Dent. He'll continue from here. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can find my screen. Right, so um, my name's Chris, as we've established, and um, I've been working on OpenStack for f just over a year, four days more than a year. And I'm one of those people who came along to OpenStack and did, in fact, look at the API and think, hmm, what's going on here? This is, uh, this is a bit confusing, a bit, a bit chaotic. Um, and that was unfortunate because I came onto the internet long before there was a web. And um, when the web did show up, I found it to be one of those things that was going to be such a, a huge promise. It had, had such a, a, a glorious opportunity for people to be able to do stuff. And it became even better when there was the idea of doing uh, web APIs. And. Uh, when I came to OpenStack, I, I struggled because, because the web APIs were, were not so great. I think of uh, web APIs as a conversation between a client and a server where the client is actually you, the person, and the server is some set of things that you want to do. There's the technical implementations of the client and the server, but they're not quite the same thing. There's a thing you want to do, there's the stuff the server will allow you to do, and there's a conversation going on between the two of you if you follow the rules of HTTP on both sides of that conversation, then you will be allowed to do things well. But in order for you to be able to do those things well, your code has to work properly and you have to use HTTP properly. And to create systems that are like that, we have to be able to test it. That's why I created Gabby. We'll get to that in a minute. So, this is how I perceived OpenStack when I first got there. I think a lot of people have this experience. This is um, a really sad guy looking at a dead clown. I guess, I guess the clown is probably the promise of OpenStack. Um, maybe that's a bit of an overstatement. Maybe that's just me. Um, it certainly was for quite a while. It was like that for so long that I finally got so frustrated that I needed to create a tool to help me. I needed to go from sort of that, which is the chaos, to this, which is elegance and balance and nice, proper webness. So how do you do that? How do you go from bad to good? Well, the first thing you tend to do is identify some of the things that are bad about the existing system. In, uh, in OpenStack, for me, the biggest problem was that stuff is very hard to learn. There's a lot of... Um, convoluted stuff in both the, the active code and the test code. When you look at the code, it's very hard to find any clear source of authority. 
where are the things that define what endpoints exist in the API? Is it the docs? Is it the code? Where in the code is it? If you're using a system that has um, object dispatch instead of explicit routing, how do you know? The tests themselves, at least for the things that I've inspected, have been horribly subclassed and just you look at a test and you don't know what it's doing. You have to chase the code through several level, levels and several steps. Um, there's client code that has been custom designed within those tests to do exactly what you want it to do. And so the tests, of course, pass because you're doing exactly what you say you're going to do. Well, out in the world, people writing client software are not going to do exactly what you want them to do. You need your server code to be resilient in the face of more more complex input. That follows on to the next point, which is basically that the testing in much of OpenStack is regression testing. It's there to make sure that things haven't broken, that things haven't gone wrong, that when we've put part A with part B, it doesn't blow up. That's good. It need, it's important to have those things, but you also want to be able to have testing that allows you to write things well in the first place. So. Some of the solutions will fix those problems. You want to be able to easily evaluate what's going on with the API. You want to write tests that aren't verbose, that they just explicitly focus down on what you want to be testing. You can read all that. I don't think I need to go into too much detail on those things because the next slide shows an example. That on the top is a traditional test. I think that comes from Solometer. But but it has the usual, the usual things. It's a, it's, a, it's a method on a class that has a special method for doing a web request that constructs a query and then evaluates the, the response. I don't know from looking at that what the full URL is, but if I go here in the Gabby example, that's the URL that's being requested. Just that. It's right there. It's in the forefront. And that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to create. And so I did. And now we're going to have a demo, which I hope will, uh, will work. The first thing we're going to do is start a live server. Gabby doesn't need a server to, to do its testing. It can use um, Whiskey Intercept, which is a tool that basically just automatically allows you to test against the the code without a server in the middle. But in this case, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to use a server. And this is just a little helper script to run uh, different tests through against that server. So uh, what a Gabby test file is, is a YAML file with a sequence of, of tests. Any test is required to have a name and a URL and nothing else. Uh, the, if you run this, it will pass because the status code of the response by default is evaluated as 200. And that's really the only thing it will check. So I'm going to run it now. And there you see that it ran. This verbose output is just something that it can do if you ask it to. It shows you the request it's going to make and then some various response information. This shows one of the things that's called a response handler. You can evaluate the response in various ways with code called handlers. This one is evaluating the strings in the response. The, the content at root on this server is just an HTML page, so this tells you the HTML and evaluates that. Response handlers are either built in and do a variety of things, and I'll show a few, a few of the other ones, or you can write your own and add them to your, uh, your test harness so that you can do things like pre-process a DOM and then evaluate it against pQuery or something like that. So there that one's go, that's passes. This one shows a little more verbosity with um, evaluating the response. We're going to send a different method instead of get, and we're going to check for a different status than 200. And in this case, we're checking for the response headers. Now, 
this demonstrates a bug either in Gabby or in my server code. 50% uh, of this time of the time this will fail because post and get will be in a different order. So let's see what happens this time, and it fails. So there's the trace pack of the failure. Down here at the bottom, you see why it failed and the, the response codes. Here is a more complex test. This one is creating a container in the API. This is basically sort of a, a, a Swift for dummies, this, this uh, little API that I created. In this case, you can send some headers. You set the, the content type. With this, you're sending data. If the value of data is not a string, it is translated into JSON before it's sent to the server. So that we're going to send a, a little object with an owner of SAM. It's going to respond with a status of 201. This next test, which will only follow after this one, they are, they are run in order. And this one um, will evaluate that the body is containing JSON with owner SAM. And it uses JSON paths. Does, is that something people are familiar with, JSON path? Basically, it allows you to do queries into op, uh, JSON objects. This is a magic variable that will be replaced by the location header from the prior response. So you can make a request of, of whatever you just created to confirm that it has the things that you want to do. So let's make sure that worked. It did. This is another one that just shows um, a different JSON path. We're checking to see what objects exist in the shed that I just created. There aren't any yet. Here we have creating an object in the shed. This is some information about a car, apparently. We're going to evaluate the response headers to check and see that it has a, a legitimate location header. Um, there's several things going on here. One is that if you bound the value of a, a header with slashes on both ends, it turns it into a regular expression. This regular expression is saying, does the thing on the end look like a UUID? Dollar scheme and dollar netlock are replaced by those values um, in, the, uh, in the server. In this case, it'll be localhost and, and HTTP. We're getting it again. We're checking that the response headers are what we expect and that the objects look like we expect. This is another create, creating another object. In this case, we're doing a put because we know the name of the thing that we're putting into the, the, uh, the shed. If you're sending data, you have to set the content type. Otherwise, it doesn't know necessarily what to do with it. In this case, um, we're sending a file that we're reading in. If you use this little, little set of symbols here, we'll read a file from the current directory and send that. So this is going to post a kitten, we hope. And I can actually check that. That's something I wanted to make sure that was working. So here's the front page. There's our kitten. Who doesn't like puppies? Here's a final object, a uh, final uh, example. Just some more um, JSON path stuff. You can do slices on, uh, on arrays. You can use JSON path in the construction of URLs and in the construction of queries against um, the, response, the previous response. So in this case, what we're doing is saying, get the first object or the first element out of the list of objects that was in this response and use that to create. Well, battery's dead. Use that to create um, the URL. Just another example of how to do some, some YAML. In this case, we're doing uh, content negotiation to ask for text plane instead of JSON, which we've been doing up till now. That all worked. Now, the, the fun thing with this is that that server code was created with test-driven design to using Gabby itself. And if we look at the server's test code, we can see 
how you would use this in your own tests. It uses the unit test, load test protocol to create tests and then provide them to the test harness. We're gonna, I'm going to run this because it should be relatively fast, just so you can see what's going on. Maybe it'll be fast. There we go. In, a, in an environment where you have concurrency happening, the tests will be divided up by the name of the file that the tests are in. So if you have multiple files, they will be distributed across the processors and each, each test file will be run in order on only that processor. Back to this. So all of this works because underneath there's the code is translating the YAML into uh, unit test test cases. And then each of those test cases is assembled into a test suite per file. And, um, and then that's run through a custom test suite that allows you to use fixtures to create data and configuration. The, um, the response handlers are built in at test creation time. Um, that relevant. So I want to get it into this part, which is how to use um, Gabby well. One of the best things about Gabby is that it makes things easy to write. You can write tests really easily, and if you, if once it becomes easy, it becomes fun just to throw crap at your API and see what happens. And this is a fantastic way to, uh, to break things. And once you break things, you have got bugs, and once you've got bugs, you can fix them, and once you fix them, you've got better stuff, which in the end is the entire reason for all this stuff. It's usually the case that if you are using this tool against an OpenStack project, you will need to establish some configuration. And the best way to do that is in a config fixture, which is associated with a test. Um, the config fixture's job is basically to uh, tell it where the API server is running, what host and port and things like that, and um, do things like, in, at least in some cases, you have to uh, disable the keystone middleware, depending on what kind of authentication tests you want to do. It's tempting to try to do too much in any one test. Because the tests are so easy to write, you kind of ten have a tendency to want to just sort of put everything in there. You sort of request every single thing and evaluate the entire body of the response in your test. If you do that, the tests become unreadable and then what's the point of using Gabby? The whole point is to make your tests more, more useful more, and more readable. It's also tempting to want to use Gabby tests to do things like test your persistence layer. That's probably not a good idea. You want your persistence layer to be a known good thing based on other tests rather than the tests you're creating now. Gabby's pretty useful for com contributing to uh, to existing OpenStack projects because it's a, an easy way to get into a project and learn about it because you can write these API tests easily and quickly and, and in the process teach yourself something about the project while doing something good for the project that you're interested in. Oh, and you know, why this is in the <laughs> oh, a working group related thing. You can also, of course, validate uh, working group guidelines with, with Gabby. Gabby itself needs better docs, doesn't everything. Um, it could also do with additional response handlers um, that allow it to evaluate specific types of content. <coughs> right now, the input data is always YAML, but there's no reason why it has to be that. You could, you could use whatever you want as long as it eventually becomes a dict that has the same structure. And uh, I think, for me, one of the things that really critical for the tool to become uh, especially healthy is that it get input from a variety of communities. Right now, um, I wrote it, and there have been maybe four or five other people who have used it. And it works for everything the five of us have tried, but that's only five people out of a whole big world. It could be a lot of things that it, it doesn't do that it should do. That's basically the end of the demo and the end of my talk. I wanted to um, point you at these things, though. The thing in the middle, the, the Gabby demo, 
that's the code I used for the demo. Um, and then the other ones are, are, are kind of obvious. I think I've left some, some time for, for questions for both of us. I hope. If you do have questions, please use the microphone over there. Or if you can't reach the microphone, um, I will repeat them for you. You, you have a question. I have a question. <laughs> um, so right now, as far as I understand, you have um, integrated Gabby tests into Solometer. And Noki. And Noki. Um, are there plans to integrate Gabby into Nova and Neutron and Cinder? That's the thing I actually forgot to mention, which is that I invite anyone who's interested in that kind of thing to find me in the hallway so that, that we can sort of get you started together. Uh, the other option is that probably Friday afternoon, I don't think many people will be doing anything, but I'll still be here. And uh, if you want to pair, if, if you know, that's still allowed in this kind of environment on, on doing this, this, uh, this work, then I'd be happy to do that. It's certainly something that I want to see happen. I think it will be very useful. Um, but I do think it's something that it's best that a community of people do it rather than just me running around from project to project to project. It helps. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the, so the question is, um, can Gabby be used for um, the unit test API versus uh, the Tempest API? So I, I, I think what you're asking is like, maybe can Gabby replace some of what Tempest is doing with the API testing? Is that? I think so, yeah. I think, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to. There are certain goals that, that the API tests that are within Tempest are trying to accomplish that aren't necessarily the same as what Gabby's trying to accomplish. There has been some discussion of using Gabby for what they're calling um, negative tests. Yeah. And uh, nothing, there hasn't been any progress on that, but it's certainly something that I think would be useful because it, it, it's sort of a fast and easy way to do, to do that job, whereas I, I think you'll recall from my earlier slide, I was, I was complaining about how some of the tests use a specialized client. Well, Tempest is the example there. I mean, Tempest's tests don't even bother to look at the response code, really. They just return the body, and, and that's not really a very good test of the entire system. Everett? Yeah. Uh, first, you took my first question, Jay, so thanks for nothing. Um, and the other thing, I wanted to make you aware of, there's an effort over in the docs land about generating API docs right from the, the Python source code. Yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced this is a good idea or not, but it seems like there might be, uh, you know, also generating these kinds of tests, the, the YAML, YAML files from that yeah, as well. Yeah, so when, when Gabby was earliest talked about, um, there was some, some discussion of, well, why not Swagger, for example? And, um, and then we could have, you know, magic docs, magic tests, magic everything. And at the time, <clears throat> I didn't go with that because I wanted to make something that was small and focused. But it would be, as, as you're saying, it would be very easy to, to take anything that auto-generates anything can be transformed. So it, would, it certainly would be possible. And I think it's probably a good idea. Well, one of the things about, um, you know, API Blueprint or Swagger is like, they're not, it's not as declarative, it's, de, it's, it's like declaring the schema of the API as opposed to uh, a test case that's sort of clearly declaring what the, like a sample looks like almost. Um, so it's a little, little bit different there. I mean, I, I, I like both Swagger and API Blueprint, but I think Gabby, certainly it's, I think reading through the Gabby files, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit clearer than reading like JSON schema from, from Swagger. But that's my I think, I think we're basically in agreement about. Hey, um, is there a way, I don't know how useful it would be yet, but is there a way you could run this as unit test and functional test from the same set of specs? 
so. Because um, it, 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 really it really off. depends on your definition of, of, of unit test. Um, against a live server and against a test runner. Yes, so it is possible to um, basically use a different set of files. Yeah, because it'd be a lot the of same, same set, set of files and... again in, in two different contexts. It's perfectly possible. Cool. And apparently we're out of time. If you've got more questions, I guess we'll both be kind yep. of around. Thank you.